Welcome back to this chapter of the Business Library. I have John Witt on here today. We're going to be talking about creating a culture of success. He's has a huge amount of experience working with big companies, both when it comes to creating the culture, but also when it comes to not hiring the headaches, something we might be speaking a little bit about in this episode. If we don't get the time, we'll have a link where you can check out the five-day event that he does. And of course, this is also sponsored by our free course, Getting Leads from Content Marketing. The link is down below along with all of John's stuff. So make sure to check it out whilst you're down there. So to start us off, John, just to get us on the same playing field, like what does it mean to have a culture of success? So if you think about uh, success, we all want success. I mean, I don't know anybody yes. that doesn't want success. And a culture is an environment. And culture is, you know, a, a subset of the word cultivate, right? And so it means that you can learn it, you can grow it. And what we want to do is create an environment that best serves the opportunity for success. And so we want to create a culture of success so that the people in that organization, in that culture, are you know, given the best opportunity for success. Hmm. So when it comes to creating the culture and giving people the best opportunity, where should people start even? Well, you know, I talk about the foundation and I think that's the key. Like, so the foundation is what does everything build upon? Now in, in the business world, we often hire for skills and experience. Um, mm -hmm. but the number one reason why people get fired is because of attitude. And so we look at that attitude as the culture, right? So if you think about an Olympic athlete, and what does it take for them to earn Olympic gold, right? What are the behaviors that they have? And you're talking about somebody that's, that's persistent, has perseverance, is disciplined and drive and all those things, right? Um, those are all attitudinal concepts. Now, they probably need to have some talent and they need to have some skill and they need to have some of those things. But the reality is that about 85% of their ability to achieve gold or achieve their goals is going to be based on their attitude. It's going to be based on those non-skill, non-knowledge items. They're about, you know, that energy, that discipline, that perseverance, because if, if they don't stick with it, they don't do the work that's necessary, they're not going to achieve Olympic gold. And so the foundation is having the right attitude in the organization. What does that look like? And it starts from the top and works its way down, right? It has to be, it has to permeate the entire organization. That's, I would say it's a given. I see it as a given. It starts from the tops and goes down, but it, I, I don't necessarily think everybody agrees at least according to their behavior. No, no, they don't. And that's why, that's why in your, so in your organization, that attitude requirement has to be um, one of the high level objectives for the organization, because when everybody has that behavior, successful opportunities occur for all of us. Now, if there's somebody that doesn't have the habit, right, doesn't have the right attitude, isn't willing to pull on the oars at the same time in the same direction, um, that that won't necessarily uh, just stop you. It'll hold you back. It, it can it could make things worse. And what I found with my clients, and again, I work with smaller businesses, you know, 10 to 50 employees, but when they struggle to move from whatever level they're at to the next level, it's almost always a people problem. It's almost always somebody that's not, that doesn't want to make the shift, that doesn't want to make the move, that doesn't, that just doesn't have the right attitude for the growth that the leader or the organization desires. When it comes to the attitude thing, what is your recommendation? Like, how would you recommend a person to go out and approach it? Is it even worth it? Or do you just fire them? Good question. That's a really good question. Um, so you can teach skills and you can teach knowledge. Attitude is much more difficult, much more value centered based in how a person grew up and how they were, you know, how they experienced nature and nurture. Um, you can, uh, through this process where you explain what success looks like, what that attitude looks like, you can at least outline what you're looking for, and then you can measure and reward the appropriate behaviors. 
And so a lot of times you can start to get people to, it does not happen overnight, but you can get people to move in that direction. And when they start to see success, then they're more likely to continue along that particular path. Um, but I won't tell you that everybody, you know, everybody buys in. It doesn't work that way. Everybody is a little bit different. If, and sometimes they're, you know, generosity is one of my key components of my business, right? So if you're generous, you're always going to have better long-term success. And so one of the generous things you can do is to help somebody find an opportunity in an organization that's more suitable for what they want to do and where they want to go, which means, and so rather than saying, I'm going to fire them, I'd rather be generous and help them get the right opportunity somewhere else, right? That's a different story than just firing them and, and kicking them out on the street. I won't tell you that you never have to do that because that's, that's just not a true statement because there are some people that, you know, that's the only way it's going to work. Um, but we want to exhaust all the other avenues first. I like that you say that. I like that you say that because in some cases, I agree with you, you can't really do anything. And it's very hard to teach people how to be a good human. It's way yeah. easier than how to do something well. And um, being a human is something that was taught at a very early age and they're stuck in their ways, most likely. And good point as well in regards to point out what you like in their attitude to get them to change. Because I actually think that's the only way to really approach it. Besides sitting them down, having that conversation. If they don't listen to that, you can only really fire them or start tailoring their attitude with showcasing and rewarding those small successes. And we talked a little bit about attitude. And one thing that I've had a gripe with some of my past employees, where if I used to be a manager at a retail store, people were quite young. Uh, the self-awareness part was a bit lacking. Like, uh, I remember once we had like a guy that was, he had 15 minutes left. He didn't really want to stay longer. And he didn't know what to do because he was quite new, but he just stood himself in the middle of the room while everyone else was running around. And I just tell him, Either you start doing something, you go home. I, I don't really care, but because right now you're just being in the way. So how do you help people to get that self-awareness? So self-awareness, um, you know, the, the, when we talk about attitude, right? Unless we know who we are, it's hard to take this human that God created and make it do anything, right? So self-awareness you have 100% control over exactly one thing on this planet, and that's you. You can make yourself do anything you want to. Be. You can't make anybody else do anything. You can try to persuade them. You can try to influence them, but you can't make them. But you can make yourself do anything you want to do. But if you don't, if you aren't aware of who you are, what your, what your ideals are, what your preferences are, um, the way you like to work, if you're not aware of any of that, then, then you're kind of stuck. I mean, you don't know how to leverage that. So when we talk about self-awareness, A, it's super important, right? It's, it's incredibly important to be aware of yourself and then to be mindful of what's going on around you. I mean, that, that's like sort of first and foremost. But the way that I work with um, clients to make them, help them become more self-aware is through the psychometrics, the behavioral assessments that are available. Um, so DISC, uh, is a behavioral assessment that I use. And it's, it's, I use it because I think it's one of the simplest ones for people to understand. But, you know, it'll go through and identify what your strengths, weaknesses, talents, preferences are, right? And so now you're more self-aware and we can build a plan for you to exercise those things in a manner that serves you effectively. But a lot of times, you know, you weren't aware of that. Now I tell people, look, if you, if you have the opportunity to go spend two hours or two years on a mountain in Tibet, you might come up with this. Because a lot of times when you read the assessment, you'll say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But it brings this, this degree of clarity to you right away. And there are lots of different assessments out there. DISC is just one, Strengths Finders, Colby. Um, there's, there's dozens. Uh, the, the latest one that I've been working with is called Working Genius by Patrick Lencioni's team. But those tools are designed to increase the self-awareness of the individual. Um, now, if you then share your set, right? And those tools are about 80% accurate. Nothing's 100% accurate. Um, but if you go through and do the work that says, yeah, this is the part of this that is accurate, and then you share that with somebody else, they'll often share 
what their skill sets are, what theirs are, right? And so now all of a sudden we know a lot more about each other and I can help you and you can help me on a much deeper level than, hi, how you doing? Good morning. Yep. <laughs> and whenever people do a disc, I would actually recommend them to get a person to read it up for them. Um, I had that, but that was because we had a person that was trained in this specifically. And it was creepy because it was like, huh, how do you know all this stuff? This is a how bit you, weird. How do, you get, how do you get these answers from those questions? Yeah. Um, it, is, it, is, it is pretty remarkable. Um, and yes, I do think that a trained uh, debrief you know, analysis of your profile is going to be a lot more effective for you as an individual than if you're trying to interpret it for yourself. It's, it's, um, you know, there's some skill in doing that. And, you know, if you, if you don't have it, then it's going to, you're not going to get the most out of that assessment. Yeah. It's, I've always been, been fascinated with the people that trained at that kind of stuff because I'm, I like psychology myself and it's, impressive of how accurate they can be in like a room of let's say 20 people they might only get a couple wrong but most of them actually spot on and it's like they'll ah, figure it out ha uh, wait 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 hold up a second we only met each other for like half a day how do you know all this stuff uh, it, okay so let me throw a different idea at you real quick right you can yeah, reverse ahead. engineer the disk assessment you can do a disk assessment based on your ideal client. So it'll tell you what behavioral status, mm -hmm. behavioral styles are most effective for your behavioral client, right? Which then gives you the messaging to reach them more effectively. You can do that. This is one of the things I teach. You can reverse engineer a job description. So typically we take it and we take it for ourselves. But if I say, hey, the job would want the person to answer like this and like this and like this. And when you do that, then it will tell you the behavioral style that is most effective for that particular job. And then it'll give you questions to be able to ask behavioral style questions, right? As opposed to skills and experience questions. And so now you're going to get, uh, this is, this is where I think some of the, the, the difference is when we're, when we're looking for the ideal employee. Now we are getting the words, the sentences and the phrases that are much more likely to attract the right employee or the right customer, right? We, we, we want to serve as many customers. We want to have the best employees, but we want the right ones. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't help to have, you know, 500 of the wrong leads, for example, right? We need the right ones. So you can use those profiles. And I, I again, I'm just a, a disc is my tool because it's, a, it's easy for people to understand. Uh, but you can use many of them in the same fashion. You can reverse engineer it to find your customer, to find your ideal employee. I'm actually going to try that out during the weekend. I'm going to take some time to, because I never thought about it, but it's actually, it's really smart and it's going to give I, some whole new perspectives on it. I'm matching. I will send you. And if anybody gets this and they want it, I have a, a 20 page, tw 20 question, sort of a short form disc, right? And it's a PDF and you basically just go through and answer the questions and then I have the answers and then you can identify the style that you're looking for. So you answer it in terms of the job, right? The job would want this answer, the job. And then you can look at the answer sheet and say, okay, the, the answer sheet says, I want this style of a person. Now, what's really amazing is we have this thing called AI today. And so you can take those numbers, right? The D, the I, the S, and the C that you get from your assessment and plug it into AI and say, okay, based on you know, the internet and all the knowledge of the internet, tell me about this person. What does this person like? What does this person need? What does this person want? And it'll give it back to you. And now all of a sudden we have another whole level of information and knowledge about what we're looking for, the type of person we want for our customer, the type of person we want for this job, the type of person we want for this employee. Um, we can be much, much more strategic. I imagine so. I imagine so. And one of the things you referenced a little bit earlier was questions and asking more behavioral questions. What is some of the good questions to actually ask an interview? Because I've been to a lot of interviews and there are plenty of bad questions. I've been asked a lot of them. Okay. So 
let's just say I'm looking for a, you know, a style of a person that's primary and S style. And I'm, I'm just making this up as we go along, right? Uh, but they also need some I characteristics and some D characters. We're all made up of all of those characteristics, right? And this job requires somebody that is, has a high degree of accuracy, right? It's an accountant or something of that sort. So one of the things I might do, and again, what I'm looking for is not their skills because they might say, oh yeah, I had a job and I did this and I went to this school and I went to that. What I want more is, is kind of who is this person, right? So I'll, I will ask behavioral questions. I'll say, so tell me a time when you had a situation that you had to get uh, you know, accurate information, digest a ton of information in an accurate manner with a tight deadline. Tell me how you did that. Tell me how you, tell me, give me, tell me what that story looks like, right? Because I want to, that's going to give me a window into who you are, which is more important to me than your skills. Now, I know you, if you don't have the skills, then, then I can't hire you, right? If you don't have the certain amount of experience, then I can't hire you. But there's a huge difference from just having the skills and the experience to then having the behavior and the attitude that's going to be successful in this job. So we ask behavioral questions. And in most jobs, there will like there's plenty of qualified candidates if you know how to find them. Oh yeah, there's yeah, very well, few there's... fields where there's like maybe a few hundred where you can't really be that picky. You have two. Is it is it Eric or is it Brian? And and one how they the answer bit. that question, how they process, how they think, how they answer that question. Uh, that tells you a lot about how they're going to fit within your organization, within your culture, within the type of organization you are and what you're trying to accomplish. Mm. A big part of accomplishing things is also identifying the different things that works, doesn't work. And building that culture requires doubling down on the right things. But a lot of the time, when something is working, multiple things are working. So, how do you? recommend people to go out there and pick the right thing. All right. So I am a huge fan of Pareto's law. That's the 80-20 rule, mm. right? The 80-20 rule says 20% of your activity generates 80% of your results. 80% of your activity generates 20% of your results. So I want to know what the 20% of things are that are generating the best results. Now, maybe they're generating the most money or they're generating the best quality or they're generating whatever you're looking for, right? It's that's, that's the thing. And then I want to look at those things first, right? That's my first cut. Um, and, and I want to find a way to get rid of everything else, right? So if I can focus in on these 20%, this is the law. This is the thing that says you can get more by doing less, right? Because you're focusing in on the 20% of activities that have the greatest return. Now, you might have to do some things. You might have to delegate. You mean, might have to assign some things to, to lesser services to be able to focus on those 20% things. But that's the first thing I would do. Now, if we have more than one thing in there that is giving us great results, you know, we have to make a decision. Does it make sense to continue down this path with three things or can we focus just on one thing and make it even better? And this is where we look at the law of comparative advantage, right? This is Ricardo's law of comparative advantage where, where you're looking to see what's the effort, what's the input necessary to get the output that we're getting. And so whatever the minimum input is to get the output, that's going to be your star. That's your number one thing. And so, you know, it, often it doesn't, you know, there's some analysis that's necessary. This isn't something that just goes, ding, I know what it is. You know, you <laughs> usually have to dig a little into it to figure it out. Um, and sometimes, um, you know, you might have to ask, you, mean, you might have to bring in some, some resources, some advisors to be able to help you get through that. Um, and then you can do the analysis. Does it does it really make sense to spend you know more time in this area here? You know, because because if it takes one unit to get you know twenty of these things over here, but it takes one and a half units to get twenty over there, both might be profitable. Both might have great results, but the first one takes less less effort to put to to get the result. Yeah, and you would technically looking at that specifically be better off just doing three times as much of or twice as much of number one. Right. Than any of number two. And yes. and it's, it's hard, right? Cause you're looking at it and say, well, these are both good. These are both working, and but it's might proven. Even, like small difference. Well, and volume makes a huge difference. I worked in the banking industry, right? And so in the banking industry, you're looking at, 
you know, tenths of a percent of a penny. Um, but when you add it up over billions and billions and trillions, of, it adds up to real money. It adds up at some point, most definitely. If, if there's enough pennies, you will have a, a billion or a trillion, depending yeah. on how many pennies you have. It's, it's, you know, that's, that's the banking industry. I have. I've learned a lot about the banking industry that I didn't think um, about, it. especially in like the the old days. And then apparently the bankers were um, so quite creative. Let's just say it like that. Oh, I think they're still very creative, right? Regulations try to, you know, you know, it's a capitalistic. We live in a capitalistic society, um, and people are going to come up with ideas. So I think creativity is not dead. Creativity is very active. <laughs> Well, I'm um, alive in the banking industry still. Yes, yes. probably um, always I, will be. The thing I learned about the banking industry is that that's not me. That's not my thing. Um, some people love numbers. Some people love doing that stuff. I, I just it drives me. I get bored. I go, I kind of go crazy. Uh, I'm I'm in the 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 you know how can I help people be better? How can I help people be better? Uh, often then the result is money, which is great if that's what they want. I really much rather spend my time helping people. What made you realize you wanted to have that shift in your life from banking to helping people? Um, it, that's another really good question. So I spent 30 years in the corporate world um, and my background was architecture and corporate real estate and then technology services and systems because everything gets, as I was growing up, the internet showed up and you know we had to modernize and use technology. Um, but the, it was, it was, a it was a, um, call it an, an act of nature, right? We had the recession in 2008, nine and 10, and the company I was with decided to move to Dallas. And I was at a point where I wasn't certain I wanted to continue because I was flying on airplanes and I was rarely home and it's not very good for family life when, when, when it's like that. Um, but I, and I couldn't move. I didn't want to move. They moved to Dallas. I didn't want to move to Dallas. Um. And I had to ask myself, do you, do, you, do you want to start your own business? Do you want to start your own thing? Or do you want to go back into the corporate world? And uh, did, did a lot of research, talked to a lot of people. I'm a big fan of learning and research. And uh, realized that, you know, I really wanted to, you know, give, an give, give running my own business, my own practice a stab. And so then I did some research on what that might look like. And I, the coaching industry showed up and, and I really thought, okay, that's good. And I've been a coach you know, if you're a parent, you're a coach to your kids, right? So I coached sports and all those other kinds of things. I, and then I realized that from a business standpoint, I had a lot of experience and I could bring these big business tools to small business. I thought, well, that's going to be great. And uh, I, I discovered that the satisfaction quotient, I don't even know if that's a real thing. I just sort of made that up. Sounds uh, nice. Is dramatically higher one-on-one -on -one when I'm helping somebody, when I'm serving somebody than it ever was in my corporate world. So in my corporate world, I was good at what I did, um, but I never got the, the personal heart satisfaction that I get from helping somebody. And, you know, that's, you know, in many ways, you know, when, when life gives you lemons, then you make lemonade, right? That was God sending me on a different path. Um, that and it was a lot of work. Don't get me wrong, because there's a big difference between corporate and small business. The the mindset, the attitude, the risk. The executive in a corporation, if he makes a mistake, he's still going to get a paycheck. He's still going to go on vacation. But the small business owner that makes that kind of mistake, you know, might not be in business and might not have be able to serve his family. Might not. There's some big, bigger consequences on the small business side. Um, and then I would then, of course, was a small business owner. So I certainly understood what those consequences were. Um, and, and really, so it was through that process that I realized how much that I, I really enjoy making a difference to, to people's lives. And when I moved up to the Northwest, I moved up here in 2020 and I won't go into the story as to why that's the case, but I, uh, I got introduced to, uh, a group of people that serve the Portland rescue mission and Portland rescue mission is, a uh, service for homeless and substance abuse, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, they're, they're really just a fabulous organization. And uh, I get the opportunity to teach. This is a pro bono thing. I don't charge anything, but I teach once a week at the, at the rescue mission at the men's home for substance abuse. And these are people that are you know dealing with a really difficult situation, right? Their lives got 
went spiraling out of control and they ended up here and we're here, we're helping them. The, the joy and the immensity of the joy that I get from that activity from making, it's just, it's unparalleled. I've never experienced it other than there. And I think everybody should experience it. It's, you know, all of a sudden you, you, for me, it's like, okay, this is what it's really all about. You know, I, I, I need money because I need to eat and I need to pay the rent. But other than that, I'd much rather serve people. Money is necessary. And I actually think one of the reasons why we as humans have gotten so far, let's say compared to other apes, is because of that innate want to help other humans. Yeah. Because we, we, we keep elevating each other. But I still imagine that shift being quite the challenge. So I wanted to ask you, perfect gateway, into how do you approach a big challenge or problem? Uh, yeah, you're just full of good questions. Um, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so so the classic, and I think this still works, uh, is you take the big question, the big problem, define it as well as you possibly can, and then break it into smaller pieces, right? And what we really want to do is we want to find out what's creating that problem. The problem itself isn't what we study. It's what is creating that problem. And sometimes that's hidden. Sometimes that's down a few levels. And so one of the things, there's a lot of studies, there's a lot of resources that you can engage to help you identify this stuff. But one of the things you could do on your own is practice the five whys. And the five whys are, you know, asking after every answer, why is that happening? Why did that happen? Right? So the first problem, we're not making enough money. That's a pretty classic problem, right? Well, why? Okay, and then you say, oh, well, it might be this, and it might be this, and it might be this. And then you say, why? And you do it at least five times. Now, this is a known quality control process, right? Why did that happen? So why did our product, why did, in, in the manufacturing area, why did this, this thing not turn out right? Right? It didn't meet our, we, we asked why. Well, how did, what, and we dig into that, and we go through this, what they call root cause analysis, to get to the thing that causes that problem. And then that becomes the constraint. And essentially what we do is we try to subordinate everything around us and tackle that constraint. We take all of our resources, all of our energy to fix that thing, right? And once it's fixed, then we will have improved. Now, maybe we haven't solved the problem, but we'll have made the results better than they were. And then we'll go find the next thing. And then we'll go find the next thing. And that's the process. You just kind of dig into it again and again and again and again. In the, in the really big business, you know, it could take a lot. It takes a lot to change an airliner or a lot to change an ocean liner, right? To make it turn left or turn right. In small business, man, you have the ability to pivot like nobody's business. Like you could pivot from today to tomorrow. All you have to do is find that thing, whatever that hinge is. And a lot of times, small hinges swing big doors, right? You find that one little thing that's, that's hanging you up, right? Uh, and you fix it and boom, life changes. That's why in my, in my coaching program, I say, I will change the trajectory of your business in 30 days or less, or I'll give you your money back, right? Now I can't fix your numbers in 30 days. That is not going to happen, but I can get, we can put together a system, a model, a process and metrics that will show you that your business is changing that it's going in a different direction than it was before in less than 30 days. And if I can't do that, then, then you don't need me. I'm not, I'm not the right guy. I like that. I especially, I like the offers of, that's so good that you kind of would be stupid to say no. I always appreciate a, an offer like yeah. that. But, well, it happens. I mean, not for everybody. I, I, and I've never said I was for everybody, but I am for some. I think it's good not being for for everybody. You you kind of want to avoid that because then you really end up being for nobody. That's a, right. a sales saying. And I actually have also heard people use the five whys, and that's not so much in the sales perspective, but when you're buying something to check is yep. this people person bullshitting or not? Because if they are, they won't get past three. That's right. That's right. No, that that tool, that root cause analysis tool, is effective in uh, in a lot of situations. Uh, yeah, and uh, it's actually not that long I found out about it, but I've been loving it ever since, actually. Um, one thing I want to make sure we have time on this episode just quickly to talk a little bit about was 
here like hiring headaches and your uh, five day masterclass mastermind it's, challenge it's it's a mastermind it's a five day challenge it's a challenge so what i do is i teach so in hiring headaches is all about helping small business owners bring in top talent and so they're typically really good at selling their products and services they they they've in the early stages, they've brought in some help and support that takes care of some some things that need to be done. But at some point, they need to bring in a leader, right? Somebody that's going to help lead this organization. Somebody that's going to, you know, help manage more people, right? Because you know, you, you figure a little boy with the fingers on the dike. You know, there's only so many fingers and toes, right? And when you run out of those, you're stuck. There's no more. Um, and so, so and and that business owner is usually an expert in their field but maybe not an expert in business and certainly probably not an expert in um, selling employment opportunities. And when you're looking for a leader, a top leader, they're probably not unemployed. They're probably working for somebody else. And so the strategic model and process that I teach, uh, in, of course, these five days, it's five one hour webinars. I do it, it's at lunchtime, typically lunchtime on the West Coast. Um, each one is standalone. Uh, but we go through the the general concept, and we go through the ideal employee and the messaging for that employee. Because that, if you if you've spent any time in marketing, you know that messaging is like that's how it works, right? If the messaging isn't right, you're not getting the customer, you're not getting the client. Uh, and then where do you put that messaging? It's it's bigger for top talent. You know, these people aren't searching Indeed typically or ZipRecruiter or Monster.com for a job because they may not be unhappy. They may not be happy, but they may not be unhappy as well. And so we need to take that messaging that we put together and put it a lot of different places. And then once we get them attracted, then we have to get them to say yes. And leaving an existing job where you're comfortable and it's paying the bills, and it, that's, that's a big effort to move, right? Big decision, big change. And so how do, we, how, do we, how do we convince them? How do we persuade them to come join us? And so that's a system uh, as opposed to the shotgun approach. Right. And you're always going to get a better result with a system. And that's what the five day challenge is, is a system to attract, acquire and retain top talent. I like the shotgun approach. Sadly, I have to agree with you. It doesn't work the best because even though I do like it. Just... Well, it, it looks like it feels like you're getting results. But remember, yes. you know, it's, you know, don't ever make the mistake of judging action as to results, right? Action does not equal results. You want to do the right action to get the results that you want. So it might feel good because you have a hundred applicants. Um, but if they're not the right applicants, it'd be much better to interview three of the right applicants than a hundred of the wrong applicants. Yeah. Uh, we have the same, I use the same example when it comes to content and marketing mm -hmm. people through content, because it's, well, would you rather have 1 million people seeing your post of the wrong people or 50 of the right people? 50 of the right and people. If, yeah, if you're a business owner, you're going to say the 50 right people. And most people, even if they're not a business owner, would rather have 50 of the right people because the million is going to see it and then, oh, okay. Oh, okay. I refer to those as vanity metrics. Yep. They look good, good but they don't Good name for Good name. <laughs> it, it, it gets the dopamine going. Yes. So. Yes. I wanted to to thank you very much for taking the time to come on the Business Library today, John, and, and sharing all your knowledge with us. I've had an absolutely blast speaking to you. Learned a few things I will try and implement my own business. Excellent. Well, I've had a great time, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. And check out all John, John's links below, both for his course about how you can end hiring headaches if you are filled with all your fingers and your toes. And also you can connect with him down there.